sessions, um, which we have, we have special guests come on and join us to work, to talk a little bit about their creative process. And then of course, to talk with you about your creative process. And our first guest in our special sessions, it couldn't be more special. It's the most special person ever. It's Oscar Eustace. And I'll give you a little bio about Oscar. Uh, you all know what Watch Me Work is. And if you don't, We've been doing it for 11 years in the lobby of the public theater, and we appreciate the public theater. We appreciate how round in uh, joining us on this journey. So let me tell you about Oscar Eustace. He has served as the artistic director of the public theater since 2005. And before that, he was the artistic director of Trinity Repertory Theater in Providence, Rhode Island from 1994 to 2005. Throughout his career, Oscar has been dedicated to the development of new work that speaks to the great issues of our time. And he's worked with countless artists to pursue uh, that aim. Uh, artists like people we all know and love, like Tony Kushner, like Susan Laurie Parks, like David Henry Wong, dear David Henry Wong, like Lin-Manuel Miranda, like Richard Nelson and Rena Groff and Terrell Alvin McCraney and Lisa Crone, just to mention a few folks he's been working with. Um, he's currently a professor at New York University and has held professorships at UCLA, Middlebury College, and Brown University. He's a force of nature uh, on the art scene, a force of nature in the downtown theater scene, a formidable presence in the uptown Broadway scene, and of course, all around the world in cultural uh, institutions. Um, so he's just amazing. So if you have questions about your creative practices that you would like to ask Oscar, hold them. We will have them, we will get to them soon shortly shortly uh but uh and if you have questions audrey is going to tell us how to get in touch uh yes ma'am hey everybody welcome to this special edition of watch me work um if you have any questions as a reminder if you're inside of the zoom all you'll need to do is press on the raise your hand button which is in a participant tab likely at the bottom of your screen on a laptop or the top if you're on an ipad or a tablet and if you're watching on howlround.tv you can actually tweet at us at, at watch me work slp with the hashtag howlround which is h-o-w-l-r-o-u-n-d or you can tweet at the public theater at public theater ny or send a message to our instagram and that's it. Great. Okay. So what we're going to do again, just to lay it out for you, we work together for 20 minutes. Here's the timer. And then today, because it's a special session, we are going to take some time to talk with Oscar about what he is up to these days, talk with Oscar Eustace about his work, and then we're going to open it up and Oscar Eustace will take your questions about your creative process and your work. Got it? And if you, if you don't, if you can't remember that, for, I'll remind you. Okay, but the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna work for, for 20 minutes. And uh, all right, so here we go. Eh? Ready, Audrey? Eh.
All right, all right. Okay. That was the first part of the show where we worked together. And now, because we're in special session, we're going to ask a few questions of Oscar about his work before we open it up to uh, questions that you all will have for Oscar about your work, your creative process. So not to like throw any surprises. I'm looking, I always look at people's background. You have like these cool like books. Are those books behind you? That's a, that's called real life. That's not like a background. That's <laughs> really, they, it, you can see right up here. Uh, I can't, uh, right there, those are three plates. That's a Dresden China plate of Brecht, a Dresden China plate of the storming of the winter palace in the October revolution and not a Dresden China plate of Prince. And that pretty much- Prince, like Prince, oh, oh pr because- like Prince from, Rogers Nelson. Because you're from, you guys are in the same- We went to high school together. They went to high school together, look at you. He was the talented one, I was the other one. You were the, you were, <laughs> you were the wonderful one who, who, who blows the world apart in beautiful ways. Yeah, yeah, so we got, we got some questions. No, yeah, well, yeah, 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 but you know, you know, you know, you were the tall one. That's right. I was always tall of it. <laughs> so, uh, so we got some questions for you, Oscar, because we want to know, we want to know about your work today. So questions like, what are you working on right now? I mean, maybe not right this second, although you can talk about what you worked on during the, during the work time. What do you well, the, the big thing that's happened, and um, forgive me for uh, going, um, anyway, it's just happened. Uh, four weeks ago, I would have told you, I would have made a very beautiful speech, very much like Joe Hodge did from the Guthrie, if you look that up in the mark, about how we're not going to turn into a television studio, that we're not doing digital content, that basically we're about live performance and we're just going to wait till we come back. And then I stopped thinking that. And uh, I was wrong. And I stopped thinking it because of the, exp the, the, the way my mind always changes from the experience of putting on a play. And we put on Richard Nelson's uh, What Do We Need to Talk About uh, two weeks ago, Wednesday, last Wednesday. Uh, so it's been two and a half weeks. And during the hour that we were watching it live, 5,000 people from 17 countries and 40 states were watching with us. In the three days after that, we got over 50,000 views and we just put it back up and it's still, and, and it satisfied sort of two different things. One is that I thought it was a terrific work of art in and of itself. And two, it demonstrated there was clearly an appetite for it. So now I've changed my mind completely. And what I'm working on, um, which is also the reason I'm nagging you, Susan Laurie, but I won't do that in front of everybody, um, is uh, trying to produce a digital season this summer. Um, and, you know, we're working with uh, WNYC the public radio, we're working with uh, WNET, public television, we're working with the public library, and we've sort of formed this loose group called the Public Consortium. And what we're trying to do is we can't replace the experience of Shakespeare in the park, but we're doing what we call Shakespeare Everywhere and trying to take the shows that we were going to do in the park and try to figure out how to transmit them and some of the experience of them digitally. Now, it won't be the same. I know that. And, you know, it also might not work. I mean, we, there's a couple of other shows that we're doing downtown. I, I say downtown, we're doing them all digitally, so they're not downtown, but, you know, that I think of as part of the downtown season. And, you know, it's not, now what I would say uh, is it feels like it's my job to continue pursuing the mission of the public within the confines we currently find ourselves in. It's not my job to sit back and wait till the world is ready for us. It's my job to, by any means necessary, keep the mission going forward. And that has improved my mood so dramatically because instead of you know, these endless Zoom meetings about cutting budgets and you know, what are we gonna do about the staff and we're, you know, all of these things which are all about retreat, I'm now spending most of my Zoom meetings, which is my working day, let's face it, um, trying to produce shows, trying to figure out how to get shows up, how to figure out how to do shows. And that, that's just been great. That's been, I mean, it's been great for my spirit. Um, and we've had one good show. We'll see if we can, if we can find other things. But I, I just one more sentence, 
it'll be long since and that'll stop. The 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 big the the thing that I'm really, really excited about is by focusing on just how do we do this right now? How do we get this done under these circumstances? I am sure that we're coming up with discoveries that are going to inform our practice forever, even after we're out of this session. And that's you know, that's the only way I, I think we, and by we, I mean all of us on this call, the only way we actually know how to change things is just do our work. And when we do our work under different circumstances, we find out stuff that's different. We learn stuff that's different, but it's not a theoretical business. It's a business about making work. I, I love it. It's not a theoretical business. Right? It's a business about making work, um, not re not regard taking into taking the circumstances into account and allowing that to inform our work. It's thrilling what what um, what you've got the public theater doing these days. So a question about like you wear many hats, many hats: um, artistic director, dramaturg, teacher, and a director. Um, so how are your practices in each of these roles similar and how are they different? Do you have to like make major pivots when you put on your different hats or how does it all work? I mean, that might be better answered by somebody looking at me than by me, but I tell you, it doesn't feel like I'm making major pivots. It feels like it's exactly what I just said, which is that in different circumstances with different people, different tools are required to do the same thing. And the, the, probably the, the best analogy that I could give you is about raising money, which I have to spend a lot of time doing. I spend a lot of time talking to people and asking them to give me that money or to give the public theater the money. And it was just hugely helpful about 25 years ago when I realized that I was doing the same thing when I was soliciting philanthropy as I do when I'm directing a play. That it's the you get a group of people sitting on a table, some of whom know each other well, some of whom have scarcely met. And it's my job to convince those people around the table that if they open their hearts and invest their resources in this thing we are working on, that good things will happen. And when, when we were doing White Noise, that's a group of actors that you have to convince to throw themselves into this really scary and upsetting material. And I, it's my job to create a room where they feel if they do that, they will be happier than if they didn't do it. They will be more filled. They'll be more excited than if they didn't. I'm doing the same people, same when I'm raising money. I'm gathering people's wealth around. I'm saying, if you invest your money in this institution, in this project, in this play, whatever it is, you will be happier. And you will be happier because you will be part of something that matters. And we actually, you know, we have studies that prove this stuff, psychological studies. People who give away money are happier than people who don't. Giving, giving gifts is the most joy producing thing that a human being can do. And so I'm not doing two completely different things when I'm directing a play and when I'm writing. I am, you know, and you, you obviously have seen almost every side of me, SLP, but you know, a lot of what I feel like I'm just trying to do is convince people that this common enterprise that we're engaged in is worth it, is worth their investment. And so I feel like what I'm doing is, um, you know, way is I'm, I'm trying to convince people of my taste. I'm trying to convince people that I love this play and you should too. I love this theater's mission and you should too. Not because you should do it because I like it, but the trust I'm trying to get is that they trust that I'm not asking them to throw their money away. I'm not asking them to throw away their emotional resources. I'm asking them to invest in something that's worth it. And uh, the only way for me to do that is to believe it. And so that's what, I mean, you know, what's a, what's a little different, a dramaturg is a little different because, and you've experienced this, is that my job when I'm working with a writer, I feel like is to understand the play better than anybody else except the writer. The writer always understands it better than me. And but my job is to you know, have read what the writer's read, to have you know, synced my thoughts up with how the writer thinks, try to understand how they think and be there. And then it's my job 
not to own any of it. And just go, what I am is I'm the friend in the room who understands as much as I can what you're doing. And my job is to help you do it. And whatever that takes, um, you know, often it's trying to reflect back to you and articulate what I think your play is trying to do. And sometimes I get it wrong, but sometimes even getting it wrong is helpful because you've been able to go, oh, if he's getting that, then I'm not doing it. And sometimes, you know, the, the most literal person, I'm not going to tell any stories about you and me, certainly, because it's too amazing. But I, I remember one of the greatest dramaturgical moments I had was I was visiting Tony Kushner up at a house he owned uh, West Point at that point. And um, I had to sort of drop a bomb on him about a play he'd written that had already been produced. And then I thought had a really... He made a mistake. He made literally a plotting mistake. And so what I did is I got up there and I went grocery shopping and I bought all these groceries for a particular baked chicken dish that I make that's very good. And I sat with him and I told him what I thought the problem was. I, I dropped my little bomb. He started laughing and he didn't stop laughing. He kept laughing. And I walked into the kitchen and I spent an hour and a half making this baked chicken dish. And when I was done, I came back and he had pages for me. He'd figured out how to do it. And I just tell you, I knew that what I needed to do was I needed to say something like that and then leave him the fuck alone, get out of his hair. And, you know, it was either going to take or it wasn't going to take. And the, the best way for me to leave him alone in his own house was to cook him dinner. Oh, I love that story. <laughs> very, very, very true. Or... Yeah, no, I have. I've never heard. I've never heard no, that story. Sure. But I also love how you talk about how you know the you have you know this amazing skill set and you employ it. You know whether it's fundraising or working with a, a writer or you know dr dramaturgy in a way because in a way you the chicken dinner story makes me think you had to convince Tony to dive in to and I uh, something you had presented to him you know so right. it's the same it's a, it's an incredible skill okay. um right. what do you what do you think do you, is there I mean and now you know the public theater is going forward digitally what's lost or, or is that well, not even not even worth talking about what is well, lost what is we gained? all know what's lost it's and it's huge because we, we lose the gathering together um we, and you know, that gathering together for celebration and for discomfort is one of the most important things we do. I mean, what I loved, you know, the performances of White Noise are some of my favorite performances of all time because everybody in the audience got uncomfortable. And every night you could see there were some people, usually there's only a few, some people just going, no, no. And, you know, somebody walked out almost every night and it was at different spots, but you could, from where they walked out, you go, oh, I know why that person, went. oh, I know, that, you know, but everybody who remained, their discomfort became part of the show, became part of the, and, you know, we obviously do other shows that are more just purely celebratory, blah, 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 um, but that event thing of what happens when we all gather in the same room, that's, I mean, that's why we love theater, that's why we fell in love with it when we were kids, is, you know, and, and why do it? And we don't have that now, certainly not in the same way. But it's not my job to focus on what we don't have. Um, if I was retired, maybe I would, could sit back and write laments and eulogies. But I still got a job. And my job is to do the work, do the work as best I can in the situations that, that I find myself in. And, and this is the one. And so, you know, look, when we did Richard's show two weeks ago, it's the first time that people in 17 countries didn't see a film of our work, saw the work exactly like people in New York were seeing it. That, I hadn't even thought of that when we first did it. And I, oh shit, that's really actually something, an opportunity out of this crisis. And so anyway, I, don't, I, I try not to spend a lot of time thinking about what we have lost because it's so clear. Right.
Um, and, and certainly, I, 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 I'm with you on that page. And certainly, one of the beautiful things about um, this is that we, we are doing Watchmen work. And I'm seeing folks who never had the time in their schedules, you know, to, to come to the lobby of the public theater and join us that way. So it's a great, it's a great gift. But yeah, but um, so now we're at the point where Oscar is going to take questions, take your questions about your work and your creative process. So, um, so Audrey, you ready? Say, yeah, let's, take it away. I'm gonna let's do it. All right, Bob, you are up first. Um, are you unmuted? Are you with us? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. Hello. Uh, question both for, for Oscar and I'd love to hear what you have to say, Susan. It's pretty specific to New York uh, and it's not specific to theater. In fact, it's not theater related in a personal way. So I was sort of working on a, a TV show, uh, an idea, something I've been working on characters. It takes place in Brooklyn, um, you know, and I'm just trying to kind of wrap my head around how to continue writing it in this moment when the future and the way people perceive the world and it just feels so not even like I'm looking for an excuse, but sort of disingenuous to try and wrap my head around it, but not acknowledge that things on a social level like are gonna be so different, even if every conversation, I just, I, I can't conceive of it. And I'm wondering how you would both think about creating something, be it theater, be it television, be it silly, be it macabre, whatever, about the world that we still are so kind of clueless about, but wanting to keep working on a project that, you know, is about New York and is even about New York during and after this. SLP, do you want to start? You're the writer. Do you want me to go? Well, listen, Bob, I'm, I, first of all, I'm, I can't be that helpful because I don't have to do what you have to do. I don't have to sit down and look at a blank sheet of paper and make this shit up. And I'm in awe of that. So the first thing I want to say is take anything I say with a big grain of salt because I can't do what you do. But the second thing I'd say is this life hasn't stopped. This is your life. You're in it. This is our life. This is New York City's life. And I think that in some way we can't, and it's not going to stay this way. It's going to change. It'll be different in a month. It'll be very different in three months. It'll be very different in two years. But I don't think, you know, that we can't try to write for a world that we imagine that's going to be happening unless the imagination is part of the act. We can't write for a world that's in the past unless it's supposed to be a historical drama and you're trying to write it. You have to write influenced by everything, what's happening right now, what's happening. And I'm not sure, you know, this is a really big deal for us. I don't think this is going to be a really big deal in the history of humankind. I think that humankind has been through a lot of plagues that are a lot worse than this one. Um, Shakespeare's theaters shut four times in his career for the season because of the plague in London. Everybody who could got the fuck out of London. When we talk about Shakespeare's plays, we don't talk about the plague. That wasn't the important thing about him. The important thing about him was that his people were alive, the conflicts were real, the way he expressed it was beautiful and deep. So. I'm just, I'm just, you know, part of me is just saying, don't overweight, don't or overthink what's exactly happening right now. You're not writing for probably for this second. And yeah, I, I totally agree with Oscar. Bob, you know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, well, um, write, write your, write your play, Bob. Write your play, you know, um, because. I always wonder when somebody says, you know, something happened and it's, it's causing me to stutter in, in the writing process. I'm like, maybe it's what you're talking about and maybe it's something else. You know what I mean? Maybe those voices are just getting in your head and causing you to, to pause. So keep taking the world in and, and keep writing. And, and me too, even though I am a writer, I don't have to write. I'm not writing your work. So more power to you, man. And keep showing up here because we can keep cheering you on and maybe our, our answers will be smarter or better or longer next time. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. All right. Up next, we've got Devin. Ooh. Devin, you're unmuted. Go for hey, it. Devin. Hi, Oscar. Um, I'm in Los Angeles. And I, I just have to say for me, and I guess I've said this before, is that this is a silver lining 
of a dreadful situation <laughs> of the pandemic. I was um, this morning. I was on face, uh, Facebook for a minute, and there was Elizabeth Marvel giving an acting class in Shakespeare. And I thought, wow, I'm sequestered, but I, there's Elizabeth Marvel on my tele, on my screen, and there's uh, Dr. Parks, as I call her, the writing doctor. And then today, I'm going to get to see Oscar. So I, you know, it's just like. It's just amazing uh, what what um, this these opportunities, as you referred to, um, and these opportunities in terms of a transformation in theater. So, um, I guess um, I, I my question is, I mean, I, I was sort of going to ask what Bob asked, but you've already addressed that. But I love what you were saying about being a dra dramaturg and um, how you're the best friend to the playwright in the room, with all the knowledge that the playwright has. Um, so I guess um, what I want to ask is, um, okay, this is a strange question. So like, how is a dramaturg born? <laughs> I mean, it's such an unnatural profession, actually, when you think about it, like, how does, it, how does someone, Completely. you know, like the brain, like, what is that? It is, I, I, I actually I don't think I was born to be a dramaturg. My mother <laughs> wouldn't have known what the word meant. I don't think that's why she gave birth to me. But, um, Janet Malcolm called uh, being a psychoanalyst the impossible profession. She wrote a book about psychoanalysis called that. And I, I think it's actually similar because um, the reason she said psychoanalysis was impossible is that essentially you had to be totally present with another person without letting your own stuff interfere with how you're seeing, relating them and reflecting back. You had to be somehow both a completely, and, and you couldn't be a nebbish, you couldn't be nothing. You had to be smart and full and present, and yet you had to not let your stuff get in between your client and your clients, your ability to reflect your image. And she said, I think mean, quite rightly, this is an impossible thing to do. One of the things I've said is that dramaturgy is not something that should be a profession. It's something that can be a practice. But when I do it right, there is a kind of um, giving up of myself that is not a human thing to do. It's not a human thing to do all the time. It doesn't satisfy everything about the human. So every dramaturg in the old days when we were new play dramaturgs in America were getting started in the eighties, I literally, could point to every dramaturg I knew and went, either they're useless because they don't have enough of a self to actually help a writer, mm -hmm. or they have serious boundary issues. <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and they fall in love with their writer and they think they're the writer and they, you know, and it literally, everybody was in one of those camps. I, I think we've gotten a little smarter, but one of the ways we've gotten smarter is that most dramaturgs do something else. And I do other things that are really about me, that are really where my personality is expressed. And I do enough of them so I don't feel like I'm burning myself up when I sit and listen to Susan Laurie talk for hours. I feel like I can be, you know what I'm saying, Nadar? It's just, it's, you, 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 you're giving yourself to another person in a way that is beautiful and problematic unless you balance it. So I feel very... Um, dramaturgy as practiced in the United States, because in, you know, in Europe where this whole thing started, new play development was not dramaturgy at all. When I first met dramaturgs in the seventies, when I was working in Germany and Switzerland, those guys didn't do new play development. They did tons of research about, you know, Faustus and why we should be doing it now, or, you know, shows de Roybar and what's the, you know, they produced program books that were 300, literally 300 pages long that you could buy in the theaters. But that was a but here in the States, for some reason, dramaturgy and new play development have really become almost synonymous. And be careful that your dramaturg really has a life. Otherwise, you could get in trouble. Thank you, Oscar. Yeah. Thank you, Devin. Um, all right, up next, we've got William. Are you with us, William? Yes, I am. Hello. Oh, hi. Hello. So since I've started playwriting, I've noticed that a lot of my work tends to either be adaptations of existing work or biographical pieces based in history. And one thing I've always struggled with is one, when do you put down the research and begin writing? And also when do you find the moments that 
it's okay to change either what's in the source material or in history and what should remain hard fact. Suma, do you want me to take that? Yes, that's why you're here. Oh. <laughs> um, first of all, it's always the moment to start writing. Uh, as soon as you have something to write, you should start writing. Um, you should not, you know, one of the worst things that can happen, I'm sure it's happened to you, it's happened to me, is you get stuck in feeling like if you just read one more book, then you'll be a writer. You know, if I just, if I just can really memorize the Elizabethan world picture, then I can direct Shakespeare. And the fact is, you can write without any research. You get to write anytime you want. And what can you change and what can you make up? Anything anything at all um you know and by the way shakespeare as near as we can tell there are one or perhaps two original plots in all of shakespeare's oeuvre we can't find any antecedent for midsummer night's dream and there's one other one other than that he stole his plots his plots are not what made him great it's what he did with the plots that made him great so you don't get big points for originality the only thing i'll say about changing and staying the same I don't know if this is an exact analogy, but as a director, I feel like every time I've made a mis big mistake, it's because I was flexible where I shouldn't have been or where I held fast to something that I shouldn't have. I, I made a, a, a classification mistake. And what I mean by that is that there's certain things that um, when I have ideas about shows, for example, there are certain things that are at the core of that idea that are the central pillar of that idea. That's why I want to do this. That's where it gets my heart going. That's where, where, and I have at times in the confusion of producing, been too flexible about that. Going, oh, well, you know, the actor hates it. And the, you know, they're like, oh, I mean, we could change it. Maybe we could. And suddenly I find I've lost the show. And the way that as a director, you lose the show is you walk into rehearsal and you don't know what you want to do because you don't know what show you're making anymore. It's the most horrible feeling. You can pretend to give notes to people, but you no longer have a sense of what you're trying to make, so they're, they're fake. Or on the other hand, I've clung fast to something I was certain was important, it really, and then I realized this, but I'm killing the show because I'm acting as if this is the heart of the show, and this is just a tactic. This is just, this doesn't, you know. Um, I, I, I worked the movie of Lincoln, you guys probably know, right? that Tony Kirshner wrote. We worked for years on the script that made that movie about the election of 1864. And then at a certain point, Tony went, you know, that's actually not the story. The story is the passing of the amendment. The story isn't the election. Years of work, thousands of pages flushed down the toilet, but not really, because all of that turned out to be necessary for what he wrote. But you know, he changed his mind and he was, and it's one of the things that a great writer can do. Susan Lloyd, when you came in to me talking about the end of Father Comes Home, that was, that's, that's another story to tell, the pictures he ever did. Susan Lloyd was in the middle of a rehearsal with Joe Bonney of, of Father Comes Home, you know, a play that we'd worked on for years. And, oh, and she came and watched, she said, I have to change the ending. I have to change the ending. I was fucking brilliant, guys. I sat there, I nodded my head for 15 minutes as she talked to me. And when she was done, I said, that sounds right. And she went off and changed and went boom. So I was the brilliant one, right? Just, it was, you you know, a great writer has the courage to change stuff that they thought was absolutely immutable because they can recognize when, oh no, that thing I thought was central, Homer dying, actually it's the worst thing. It's actually stopping the play, it's not, liberating it so it's that kind of you know that i'm much more interested in that william than i am in you know whether something is historically factually correct or not or whether you're changing the adapted material there are no rules in a knife fight as butch cassidy would say awesome thank you thank you thank you all right up next we've got chris chris are you with us I am. Hello. Um, my question is, um, so Tony Kushner has said that you're one of his favorite dramaturgs to work with, Oscar. And so I was wondering 
how do you know what questions to ask a playwright when you're working with them? One of his favorite dramaturgs, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> I better be his favorite. Listen, you, 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 there's no science, there's no science to any of this. What, what, what you try to do is you try to shut up about anything you don't understand or anything you don't love. And that's one of the things that I feel like is an absolute world. There are wonderful plays, wonderful pieces that I absolutely should not dramaturg because I don't love them. I don't get them enough. I perfect example is I really tried to, when I first taken this job, uh, Michael Mayer brought to me his, uh, you know, the production of Spring Awakening, which at that time nobody would do. And I loved Vedekind, I knew Spring Awakening. I, I read it, I listened to it, and it just, I thought it didn't work, didn't like it, didn't like it. I said, no, a few years later, it's a big hit on Broadway winning all these awards, and I go to it, and I think, okay, this will be a lesson in humility for me. I will see in it what I didn't see. And I watched it, and it left me completely cold again. What it meant was I was not the guy to work on that. I didn't love it. I didn't, it made no sense. I didn't understand why if they could sing those songs, they were sexually repressed because those songs were not sexually repressed. It didn't make any sense to me. But that was just me. And all it means is you don't work on something unless you love it and unless you have a feel for the writer. And then if you do, you just have to read as deeply as you can, you, your own responses or your guide, and you ask the questions that you actually have. You don't make them up. Although one thing I will say that um, Rena Groff once played, paid me a huge compliment. She, you know, there was one point where I gave her a note on a play and she looked at me and she said, how long have you been thinking that note? I said, well, yeah. That, and she said, no, really, when did you first think that? I said, about a year ago. And she said, you just did the, I could not have heard that note until now. So that's the other thing you gotta do. You gotta be so empathic with the writer. So you have to care about them more than you care about yourself for those moments. And you don't, you don't give them stuff they can't use. I, Amlin Gray, very early in my career, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, but very early in my career, I was working with a wonderful writer named Amlin Gray. And we were working on this adaptation of Uber Wah um, in the 1980s. And, you know, we thought it was great political comedy, it was great. And then we were slaving over one problem. And then at about midnight, I went, oh, Emily, I know how to solve this. I got it, I got it. And I, I outlined this really smart idea for how to solve the problem. And Emily just looked at me kind of gimlet eyed and said, yeah, Oscar, that's a great idea. The problem is it stinks of you. <laughs> <laughs> what he meant was, you know, that old myth, but that may be true. But you pick up a baby bird and you put it in its nest and its mother will reject it because of the human smell. Amlin knew if he put that idea in his play, every time he tried to write, there would be Oscar's idea sitting there and he couldn't write it. So you got to make sure that, you know, you got to be sure that you're in sync with what the writer is trying to do and when they're trying to do it. Is there also that you, you, you give a lot of great ideas, but is it somehow that you don't put your smell on it how do you do that yeah you somehow yeah so the ones that you can actually like you had a notion for tony you've had plenty of ideas for me and you've managed to convey them in a way that <laughs> where they don't smell like that's about, i don't know not, how you do but that that's, <laughs> but that's about not owning it and that's about being totally clear in your mind you don't own it um lynn thompson was the dramaturg on rent and after jonathan marson died she sued the estate for a piece of the royalties. And what she said was that Jonathan had made an agreement with her to give her part of the royalties and then he died and it wasn't written down. So she got part of the royalties. And that's fine. And you, you have a verbal agreement with a dead guy. That's hard to litigate, but you can litigate that. But then she did something terrible. She tried to turn it into a class action suit for dramaturgs. And they subpoenaed me, went inside to testify in court. And I told Lynn, if you have me testify, I'm going to destroy your case because I'm going to say that if you, by some weird chance, win this suit, you will destroy my profession. If writers have to worry when they're talking to me that I'm going to claim ownership over some of their piece, if they listen to me, 
Well, we know what we have. That's called Hollywood. That's called, you know what I mean? That's, and that is not what we do here. What we do in our little realm is we treasure the individuality of writers' voices. We treasure that no Susan Murray Parks play could ever have been improved by a committee. It can't because that's not what you're after. You're after that individual voice. And you've got to believe that all the way through your body. And then it's easy because then it's not your play. It's your play, Susan Murray. I'm surprised by And be very careful of talking to people who don't get that about your work because people have to get that because uh, Ron Lenny used to say that the three fundamental human desires, the desire to eat, the desire to have sex, and the desire to rewrite somebody else's play. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you know, it's true that's out there in the world. You have to avoid those people. Well, it's just about six o'clock, you guys. Oh my God. <laughs> you, you, uh, you must promise us, Oscar, that you will come back and visit and visit, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, because it's, you are our first and special guest and our most special special guest. Um, I'm glad that I, I was the first because I have to have been the best one so far. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I would just say to all of you, it's been a, it's a real pleasure to have you. I've loved watching me work in its existence for 11 years. I'm very honored to get to participate. And Susan Moy knows I'll do whatever she tells me to do. So, you know, if she wants me to come back. I'll come back. <laughs> you better. Okay. God bless Amazing. you, man. Have a great rest of your day. And Audrey, we have a, we have more special guests. Are they on the website? How do we how do we? They do? are on the website for this week. Tomorrow, we actually have Young Jean Lee joining us, and on Thursday, we'll have Tim Blake Nelson. Oh, so. Come on back! So, come on, come on so back. much for being the best guest. I'll get my <laughs> Friday. You, you, like you are the you are the you are the you are the you will always be the best and the first. It's something like Thomas the Train or something. The first and the best. It's first and the best. Yeah. And just a reminder to sign up at three p.m. By 3 p.m. every single day on the website, and I'll send you a Zoom link between 3 p.m. and 4:30 p.m. Eastern. And that's it. Okay. We love you guys. Thank you so we much. We love you. Thank you, Susan Thank you, Oscar. Thanks, Oscar. Thank Thanks, Audrey. Bye. Thanks, everyone.